third time's the charm. Okay, everyone, welcome to Palestine Days, day three, here at CAP. Uh, my name is Razan Saraf. I'm a curator based here in CAP part-time, and I'm honored to be moderating this discussion with Sami and Sirin. I'll be reading their biography, but I'll be introducing the book first. Uh, in 1967, Sirin and Sawalha's mother, with her young children, walked back to Palestine against the traffic of exile. My Brother, My Land is the story of Sirin's family in the decades that followed and their lives in the Palestinian village of Kafar Rai. From Sirin's early life, growing up in the shadow of the 67 war and her family's work as farmers caring for their land, to the involvement of her brother Iyad in armed resistance in the first and second intifada, Sami Hermes and Sirin Swalha craft a rich story of intertwining voices, mixing genres of oral history, memoir, and creative nonfiction. Through the lives of the Swalha family and the story of Iyad's involvement in the Palestinian Islamic Jihad, Hermes confronts readers with the politics and complexities of armed resistance and the ethical tensions and contradictions that, that arise, as well as with the disposition, dispossession and suffocation of people living under occupation and their ordinary lives in such times. Whether the story leaves readers discomforted, angry, or empowered, they will certainly emerge with a deeper understanding of the Palestinian predicament. Okay. Uh, I'll be introducing the speakers today. Sami Hermes, PhD, is the Director of the Liberal Arts Program and Associate Professor of Anthropology at Northwestern University in Qatar. He obtained his doctorate degree from the Department of Anthropology at Princeton University. He is the author of Wars Coming Between Past and Future Violence in Lebanon, which focuses on the everyday life of political violence in Lebanon and how people recollect and anticipate this violence. And My Brother, My Land, A Story from Palestine, that tells the story of a Palestinian family resisting ongoing Israeli settler colonialism. Sirin Swalha, born in the small village of Kafarai in Jinian, Palestine, comes from a family deeply connected to the region's rich history. She moved to the US in 1990 and completed her bachelor's and master's degree in Ryder University, recognized by Cornell University for her outstanding contributions to education in 2022. She serves as a social studies teacher in New Jersey. Beyond academia, she's a passionate chef and compelling storyteller, sharing her family's experiences under occupation. My brother, my land, is a story of her family. Um, for today's discussion, Sami and Sidney are going to read some excerpts from the book and do some intros, and then have a conversation. I'll come back in towards the end for a Q&A, so if anyone has any questions, just keep those in mind for the end of the conversation. And without further ado, welcome Sami and Sidney. Thank you. Uh, thank you, everyone. I hope uh, the sounds the sounds not so bad. It uh, feels a bit echoing from, from our end. Uh, so let us know if, if the voice is uh, not carrying or it's fine. Um, first of all, I want to thank uh, uh, Mohammed Hanaidi and uh, the Contemporary Art Platform for ha um, organizing this and having us here today. Uh, to uh, Brahim, Farghali, and uh, Hassan, uh, I also want to thank my mother, who's uh, put in a lot of time <laughs> organizing uh, this, uh, this event. Uh, and, and my father as well. I, I, my, my father for supporting me, my mother for <laughs> this. Uh, um, it's, uh, it's really wonderful to be um, back in Kuwait. Uh, this is uh, a second homeland. Uh, for me, uh, born here, as many of you know. Um, so I'm going to just make, uh, uh, make a few remarks and then I'll pass it on to Sirin. And the way it will work then is I'll uh, read a little bit from the book, a scene, and then Sirin will um, uh, talk a little bit about, about the scene. And we'll go back and forth a little bit. Um, so I want to begin. Uh, I wrote this book, I began writing this book, uh, we began uh, working on this book 20 years ago. Um, it's been a long process, a long struggle. Um, there were times uh, when, uh, when the, the burden of the responsibility that I had, that Sirin 
you know, placed on my shoulders was, was really heavy. Uh, when someone gives you um, a story and presents you with a story, their, their life, and uh, it's just sitting there and it's waiting to be published, uh, it starts to weigh, weigh on you. Um, 20 years ago when I wrote this, um, I, sorry, 20 years ago when I took on this project, I had wanted to write something that would move people to action. Um, and we see today, uh, especially this week, uh, the, the actions in at least the US and Europe. Um, students uh, struggling against uh, obscene power, uh, trying to, to move things. And so I want to begin by saying, I know a lot of you here are Palestinian, but a lot of you also are not. Um, and it's important to understand that uh, when we talk about genocide, when we talk about apartheid, um, we're talking about crimes against humanity. We're not talking about crimes against Palestinians. And so it's incumbent on us as human beings to act, not as Palestinians or as Kuwaitis or Lebanese, but as humans to act. Um, and that's why it's called a crime against humanity. Um, and so I, I just, I want to begin with that because um, one of the motivations of this book is to um, make you feel in order to act. Um, and it's important just to also recognize that, uh, that this crime is being conducted on the bodies of Palestinians, but it's a crime against us all. Um, so just uh, last note, the book um, as uh, Razan, thank you uh, also for introducing us. Um, as she said, the book is about uh, Sireen, it's about her brother, Iyad, uh, it's about uh, her family and her village, and about Palestine. And so um, hopefully you'll get a little taste of that today in the, uh, in the scenes that I'm gonna read. Um, it begins with uh, Sireen, her two sisters and her mother uh, walking back, again, as the, the blurb in the book says, walking back against the traffic of exile. They're actually in Jordan in 1967 when the war begins. And her mother decides to walk back, uh, to go back to Palestine, to refuse to be uh, a refugee, having seen what happened in uh, 1948 uh, with her father. Um, and so this is how the, the book begins. But I'll uh, give Sireen uh, a chance to say a few words and then I'll, I'll read. Assalamu alaikum. Hello, everyone. I am so honored first to be in Kuwait. Um, it's just like looking at all of these people. I had two roommates in Jordan in college in the 80s. And I know Kuwait street by street. And when I tell people, where are you from Kuwait? They said, did you live there? Yes, I always pretend I lived in Kuwait. So I know Shaib al Salmi, al Fahil, and everywhere. So I'm so lucky to be here. Um, it's an honor for me to see all of uh, the happy faces and uh, the eyes who are really looking forward to listen to this story. The Sawalha family is one family out of more than 15 million Palestinians, a family who live in a small village. But the, the meeting Sami, I'm, I'm the, one of the 13 who love to talk a lot, by the way. My mom used to say that. And... Um, Every time I see somebody, I want to tell them all my life story in one sitting. Uh, but Sammy just moved in, uh, this young students, and uh, we record and record and record. But then Sammy got busy, got married, moved to Beirut, <laughs> have children, and start like slowly uh, busy with life. But I'm the one who kept pushing and calling and, and nagging, like, when is the book is gonna be out? What we're doing? And then it was really, it, it came in a nice time. I know he, he said 20 years, but don't worry. The whole 20 years he was working. He never stopped working. Uh, but in the same time, he was building a family and a career in those 20 years. And he kept the book um, uh, in his mind and it came in the right time. So I hope you enjoy it. I hope you will find some similarity to your own family and your story, the Palestinian story. And I always tell people, we live to tell, 
And we are the people who has a story always to tell. So it's our time to tell that story. And I hope you guys enjoy it. And I'm looking forward to all your feedback. Thank you very much. Uh, so I'm going to read um, a scene. This is uh, from the prologue. Uh, it's uh, the, the beginning of, of the, the book. Um, I chose this actually um, not realizing uh, the uh, sort of uh, how important the scene was to Sirin. Uh, a lot of this book, a lot of our conversations after the first two years when I was in Princeton, when we, we met in Princeton in 2005, um, I was a student and, and she was in, the, uh, in town. Um, but after those first two years I left, as she said, and a lot of the work was done on WhatsApp, uh, on the phone, over email, and so I didn't realize uh, the impact of, of this uh, you know, until, until recently. Uh, I'm also getting old, so I can't use my glasses to read anymore. Um, okay. Visitor's room. An Israeli prison, 1999. Returning to the prison consumed all of Amusev's energy. Afterward, she remained in bed all day. But like the full moon, she had to return. She had to see her son. For in his absence, her chest was tight, her breaths suffocating. Habibi, Yaeni, how are you? She asked him excitedly. I'm good. God makes things easy. Iyad responded, his face lit up with joy. Then he paused and glanced around. Where's the Hajj? He asked his mother. Abu Kantaban, your father was tired the past two days. He didn't think we would be able to see you, replied Um Yusuf. Iyad met his mother's words with a slight frown and lowered eyebrows. He nodded. His father had been dealing with diabetes for over 10 years. Sirin examined her younger brother as he ch exchanged words with their mother. She could see him panning the room as if still expecting their father to emerge from the shadows. His broad shoulders shrugged at the news. She saw her eyes in him, earthy, with a blend of green and brown, now shimmering against his short, dark beard. Sirin's voice. It was hard to imagine, despite all the years that had gone by with him in prison, that my brother had been involved in resistance activities, that my brother was a prisoner of war. She thought back to the last time she saw him free, a time before she had left for the US. The two of them were brother and sister. This was true. But they might as well have been strangers leading separate lives, strangers who left indelible marks on each other. Sirin had been around in Iyad's early years, she had spent many hours telling him stories and talking of, taking him on imaginary adventures, but it had been a decade and a half since they had lived under the same roof, a decade and a half since their paths began to diverge. In Sirin's voice. There is one story I always remember, the story of Shatir Hassan, the brave, smart, hardworking Hassan. In my version, Hassan falls in love with the king's daughter, the king agrees to let them marry on condition that Hassan is able to retrieve a stolen jewel on the peak of a mountain. Seven hills, each guarded by a hyena that Hassan has to outwit, stands between him and the peak. It is a near impossible task. Sometimes the story took me two nights to complete, and Iyad listened to every word. Shatir Hassan is ultimately able to outmaneuver the hyenas, free the jewel, and live happily ever after with the king's daughter. Sirin, I miss your stories, Iyad blurted out. Sirin smiled. It was as if the two of them were little again. He wanted her to talk about her life, but the prison walls did not inspire her. She glanced at her mother. Although she knew there was tenderness underneath, their relationship had always been rocky. She did not want to discuss her problems in the U.S. around her, and Iyad would likely not understand or might take their mother's side anyway. She decided the less they knew, the better, so she stuck with generalities. Mother and sister sat with Iyad for over an hour that day. His face was bright and alive. The two women were all smiles. They all laughed together, and he felt rejuvenated. But there were moments when they avoided eye contact and fidgeted, studied their hands, repeated questions they had already asked about Iyad's health and whether he had enough food. 
when they felt the sting of the place and were reminded of the walls around them. Walls within the walls of occupation within which each of their lives was framed. Before they left, Iyad pleaded with Sirin to help him. Sirin, you have to get me out. Use your contacts in the US. Don't leave me here. Thank you. Uh, when Sammy wanted to pick up what should we read, I used to tell him, this is my happiest page in the book, by the way. But it just has so much memory. I was working in the United Nations. I moved to the US 1990, got a job in the UN, and I have a lot of connection. And here I am, my son is in prison. It's been eight years, I did not see him. And I insist to visit a private visit, not from behind the fence while I can barely touch his hand. I want it in a room with a time where I can hug him and touch him and uh, sit with him. I was guaranteed the visit by the Red Cross and Amnesty International. But I just want to tell you, I just arrived to Kufur Rai from Al Jusir uh, with my two kids. Uh, Zaid was three years old, Basil was six years old. And that night, I'm so excited. Um, who's going to come and visit with me? My mom, of course, doesn't want. You don't know what it means to visit a prison in Israeli um, uh, after, like, literally take you from 2, 3 o'clock in the morning and you don't come back until later at night. And he was in Askalan. Uh, Askalan is in the border of Gaza Strip. And uh, my mom is pushing my dad. My dad is pushing my mom. Uh, in the end, my dad says, no way, I'll take the trip. It's for me and my kids only. So in the morning, my mom wake up at 2 o'clock in the morning. I grab Basil and Zaid with their pajama. Uh, as every mom, Zaid uh, to Lebani, Jibne, Khubiz, Maye, everything for the whole day trip. Uh, took a, a small uh, taxi from Kufur Rai to Jinin Red Cross. Uh, people are pushing and, and shoving each other. Who's going to get to the bus? Oh my God, I cannot describe the buses. The bus is no windows. The seats are ribbed. It's a place for men to stand and sit in the steps. Only the women sit. So me and my are sitting. I have my older Basil, six years old, in my lab, half asleep. She has Z in her lab. Um, by uh, nine in the morning, they drop us in a field next to Tulkarim, a cornfield. All the women open their food, put the, uh, the briar rugs on the floor. We sat, we ate breakfast together. And then you have to shovel to another bus to Askalan. I think we got to Askalan around 10.30 in the morning, uh, 1990. And uh, I went to the window. And the Israeli soldiers throw my American passport and the permission I have. And he said, get the way out of my face. Curse me a couple of words. Uh, you cannot have a private visit with your brother. Oh, my goodness. I went crazy. As I told you, I don't take a no as an answer. Uh, nobody has cell phone. I looked around. I'm in nowhere. It's a desert. But in my way to the prison, within 20 minutes, I saw a public phone. I left the kids with my mom. I ran to the public phone. I called, collect to the Red Cross in Jerusalem, collect to the Red Cross in Tel Aviv, insist, no way I want to visit. They guaranteed the visit. But it's not guaranteed a visit. They told me to go to the main gate, ask about so-and-so. Uh, she will come and take you from the main gate. So the manager or the supervisor or some woman who's in charge of the prison uh, in, a, in, in a civilian clothes came into the gate, asked about me. And I said, yes, that's her. And she said, who's with you? Oh, boy. I said, my mom and my two children. She did not look at the permission from the UN. The visit is only me and my children. So she said, call them from the visitor side to the, this main entrance. So I called them. My mom think I'm joking. She's going to visit her son after eight years. She's going to touch him. She's going to hug him. <laughs> and until now, I cry. When I remember, how did she cry? She, she could not imagine she's going to visit. She kept blaming my dad. Babbling, oh my God, Ultullo, Yareto Red Alay, Yareto Ija, Kanzar Zayi. 
she could not stop thinking of my dad who missed the visit. So we got to the body search. Before we left Kufarai, she went to the bustan, to the garden. She picked cherry plums from the trees and she had one piece in each bucket of my children. And she said, when you make it inside, خلي إياد يأكل من ثمر الأرض. Let Iyad eat from our tree fruits. So my kids, um, you know, American kids, curly long hair. They kept calling him and playing with him, uh, the Israeli, as Clinton baby. Bill Clinton was the president. So they were able to find two in one of my children's bucket, the other two made it to inside, and she made it. Last time I saw a year 1990 in December, this little kid, I walked into the prison, this tall, gorgeous boy, I, I, I could not recognize him. So he came in, Alia Majnuni, you did it. That's exactly, yeah, Majnuni, you did it. I was like, yeah, so we hug. <laughs> Sorry, I really, before I left the hotel, I took the tissue. <laughs> so, we visit, and like all uncles, he's so proud that he's seeing my children for the first time. They have a canteer, a store in the prison. My mom put him money every month to buy candy and chocolate. He used all his money. Literally came back with two garbage bags full of every candy and chocolate and drink in that canteer, they call it, just for my children. And we sat, and, and the kid, it, like with all this prison and all the struggle he has in prison, he just wanna talk. Uh, politics, uh, religion. He, I remember he asked me for the Quran translation for Mitwali uh, Sha'rawi from Egypt if I can get it to him and send it to prison. And uh, my mom is uh, like all mother, Yamma Ya Habibi, are you okay? Are you eating? And she's touching him and she cannot believe she's visiting. And she kept um, asking him tons and tons of questions. And me, I want to know everything and he wants to know everything about me. But while I'm leaving, he said, Matt and Sini. So this book is a proof I did not forget yet. So I left the prison, working in the UN. I have a little connection, Abu Ammar, Yasir Arafat. So I visit him in Ramallah, and we were able to hire him a lawyer, Le'at Samel, very well-known lawyer in Jerusalem. Um, to get him out. He was sentenced 215 years. He was 17 years when he was arrested, not even finished high school. And I said, um, Liat Samir refused um, no time to go make a copy of his file. So she gave me her business card and she said, go to Beit Il, military court, and get me a folder. In the military court, they did not know I'm not Liat Samuel assistant or secretary. By the way, they look at the American passport and they let me in. And they start copying the file. So he has a military court. They brought him. And I asked him, what did you do? 1,200 pages? You're 17 years old. And the answer was, Serene, I wanted to sleep. For 17 days, from the day they arrested him, until they sentenced him. I did not sleep, I did not eat. I was tortured and tortured and tortured and all I wanted just to sleep. So I signed whatever they asked me and I wanted to sleep and not care. What. So he was taking this much sentence for 215 years for a crime. As a 17 years, maybe he did not commit half of them. But that's the result of the occupation. The other thing Sammy talked about is storytelling. I love storytelling, and I have this, Sammy keep telling me, a memory when we met in uh, 2006, right? My 2005. He, by, by the way, uh, mom and dad maybe can agree. Remember his nice hair up to here? He was so young, like 
Uh, so for me, he was like my son. And actually, when always I ask for the children, my grandchildren, I call them. I'm sorry, I'm sharing your grandchildren with you. So for me, even the, the years is not a big difference. For me, I'm a mother of three children, and Sammy is a student in the university. So um, I used to tell my, my brother and sister stories. So my mom has three girls. I'm number three, Suzanne, Maysoon, and Sirin. Every two years, I'm number three. And then a few years because of 1967 war, my father stayed um, in Abu Dhabi, my mom in uh, Kufur Rai. Um, she could not have children. Uh, and then she started with the three boys. Uh, by the way, when, she, when I was born, Jidditi, my teta, brought Silfana. Anybody from Palestine remember Silfana, the chocolate? Yes. <laughs> and she gave Silfana to the whole village in Milbanat, the mother of girls. Now she has the right that to bring my father another wife to bear him boys. And literally, she started uh, asking for ladies. So, and then... Iyad is the third boy. So I'm the third girl, he's the third boy. And literally, if you look at his picture, same curly hair, dark skin, green eyes. So I don't know, I always connected with him from childhood. So I'm the storyteller to put them to sleep. But I want to tell you how I said this, Shatir Hassan. I love that story. كان يا مكان في قديم الزمان هالولد الشاطر حسن بدي يتزوج بنت ست الحسن والجمال. وراح على يجيب الماسة من الجبل من سبع جبال وعلى سبع جبال في سبع ضباع فأول ما يوصل لأول ضبع بقول له السلام عليكم بقول له لولا سلامك سبق كلامك لخل جبال السود تسمع أرشع ضامك so he used to get scared and hide under the blanket. So the Shatir Hazar will say, peace be upon you, assalamu alaikum, and he will say, if you did not start with greeting me with the Islamic greeting, uh, the whole seven mountain will hear me crushing your bones. And then he will go to the second brother in the second mountain, and he repeats the same thing until he gets to the seven mountain and get the jewel. But I used to extend it to two days to make sure my brothers like excited about the story and then sleep. And then the next day I will start a new story with another message for them. Um, so Iyad used to love those. When he was young, as all kids in the village, he played soccer barefoot in the street. So when he come home, he got a beaten and a shower, but a beaten first and then the shower second. <laughs> so he will cry and he will hide in the corner. For used to, we used to call him El Bis. This is the cat, very quiet. Uh, he cries so softly without any like loud voice or anything. So the way to put him to sleep was, is my story. And I will make up story. I'll make up story to get them to sleep because we did not have electricity in the village. We have the gas lamp. And by 7.30, 8 o'clock, you already give dinner, finish your homework, but took them to shower and tell them the story. So I was known out of all my brother and sister, the storyteller. And that's what Sammy keeps saying. I'm the storyteller. <laughs> Thank you. Uh, so one, one thing that one thing that you, um, you'll get, um, you'll see uh, in uh, the difference between uh, a writing a story and or orally telling the story. Um, and so for those of you who may have read the book or you know, w will read the book, hopefully, um, this scene that I read, uh, later on as I go into greater detail with the scene, um, but I realized in these uh, book talks when Serene tells a story that um, she brings, she always tells a story w by talking about the smuggling of the um, cherry and the chokh. And that didn't make it into the book. Um, I, it was in, in a first or second draft, but at some point as I was, you know, uh, crafting the story, you realize that uh, it's hard to keep a narrative flow in writing. So when you're talking, you can you know, uh, go on tangents and come back and your listener can follow you. 
Uh, but writing and reading has a different cadence. And so, you, you know, it, it's, uh, I'm glad that you're here and then you go and read the book and see sort of the, the difference each has. It's, they're different genres at the end of the day. Um, yeah, for those of you who do have the book and want to follow along, um, it's page uh, 38. Um, in the, ne the next scene that I'm going to read uh, is a scene where I'm in uh, Kufurai with Sireen. We're walking together, um, and she's talking to me about uh, what she's seeing. Um, just a, a, a slight caveat is this. Uh, in the book, I don't actually appear very often. I appear in the prologue and the, the final chapter and then this chapter. So the rest of the book, actually, I'm not in there, so you don't get an idea that uh, you know, this is about me. But uh, I wanted you to get a sense of you know, that this is also a book about, uh, about the village. My mornings in Kufurai often left me oscillating between serenity and unease. When a rooster cackles, a nearby dog barks, and the birds chirp through a pleasant summer breeze, one can momentarily lose sight of who is in control of this land. The hills in the distance hum secrets of the morning dew and carry stories of farmers on their way to work. All around, the landscape masks the politics in its midst, and for a moment, one could be excused for forgetting that the horizon is a prison wall and that the land is being settled by strangers. Nature gives people moments like this, perhaps, in its attempts to make the rest of the day tolerable. On my third day, Sirin and I walked into town together. She wore beige trousers and a tank top under a white, light cotton sweater and a lavender shawl patterned with black flowers hanging loosely over her hair. It was not her typical attire. She tended to wear clothes that showed her arms and shoulders, dresses with a lot more color, reds, yellows, and blues, and no head covering. In Sirin's voice, I feel like I'm the black sheep of the family now. I'm the only one who doesn't wear a hijab, and I'm too independent for my mother. She still thinks she can tell me what to do, what to wear, who to see, how to behave. I walked alongside Sirin as she looked ahead into the hills of Palestine and talked to me about her past, sometimes wide-eyed like a little girl, pointing fingers at the places where she spent the most time, sometimes with melancholy in her voice when remembering the people that were gone or the places that had changed. Together, we felt the early morning dew in the sweet but dense air, Smoke from a nearby clay oven, the taboon, filled our surroundings with the aroma of rising bread, and the world felt calm, but for a few bricklayers in the distance, hammering away at their morning. As we walked and she shared stories, I noticed her eyes soften and stare into the distance, fixating on the unseen, as if she were peering into the kufurai of old to help me imagine her village past. She almost lost her balance between these two worlds, living in one holding on to another. I tried to discern through her descriptions what only she could see. What was once a beaten path was now flattened and paved. The steep sandy slope that led from her house to the main village street met the same fate to accommodate more cars. From Sirene's childhood house, one used to be able to see the tree-scattered land stretch to the village of Saida and spot Burqin and Yabat. But now, there was no stretch of land, only a few dozen new homes built in the last decade. At night, their lights scattered around the hills, lit up the valley in between. I squinted to imagine the escape routes into the hills between Kufurai and Saida that I heard Iyad would have used to elude capture from the occupation army. How difficult they would be to take now. One would have to trust each resident along the way not to betray one's whereabouts. Sirin walked out of the side road that led to the boys' school behind Dar Abu Shakri. It was a two-minute walk from her childhood home. The girls' school was at the other end of the village. It was a long walk, 45 minutes for a young kid, she told me. I walked it. It was a trek. In Sirin's voice, my mother would watch my sisters and me from the roof as we hurried off to school. Don't you dare talk to any boys on the way. Ayeb, she would yell from above. It was her signature way of bidding us farewell every morning. In those days, from the roof, my mother had a more or less unobstructed view all the way to the corner of my grandfather's house, halfway to school. 
She was so controlling. She, walk, watched us, walk, she watched us walking back from school, and if we strayed a bit from our path, she might beat us and accuse us of trying to get the attention of boys hanging out in the streets. We were not even allowed to speak to any of our girlfriends who had brothers. Fraternizing with boys was absolutely shameful. We couldn't even go to a relative's house if there were boys there. So, if I went somewhere and just saw the shoe of a man lying outside the door of, to a house, I turned around and went home. I didn't take any chances. Serene took me into the center of the village that now felt more like a small town. The steady stream of cars disrupted her thoughts and the flow of our conversation in a way that would not have happened in the past. The village baker's store still stood, though somewhat invisible among the many shops that had sprouted over the decades. The baker's role in the village is not as vital as it used to be, as bread now pours in from other places in the West Bank. Serene and I turned to look at the original town center on a hill, a stone's throw away, where the first homes of Kufurai were built, densely, near each other, looking like a mini kasba. It stood as a ruin, though the mayor was desperately trying to preserve it. I wondered to myself, does ruin look out at us, this life, and the newer town center, and think it is better off as ruin? Serena and I spent our days this way, walking around the village, visiting relatives and her old friends. They welcomed her with warm hugs and kisses and the excitement which, with which one greets a loved one after a long period of absence. She remained connected to this place, in her element, and confident enough to introduce me to people who felt enough at ease around her to share their stories with me. In the evening, sorry, Serene and I grew closer and learned more about each other as well. In the evening, we returned to her house and exchanged thoughts on the day or caught up with her siblings. I wrote down a few notes. She narrated more stories of her life, which I always enjoyed listening to. She never tired of her memories, never tired of sharing with me all the emotions they evoked. So, um, recording and telling Sami the story, I thought it's different than walking the street of Kufurai. And like he said, Kufurai, it's like mountain area, but I mean, um, I want to describe it, one street, from the beginning of the village to the end of the village. When a car enters the village, it has to turn in the end and go back, like there is no other exit during that time. And we were the last thing in Jinin district and then Tul Karim after that. So the village, so the boys and the girls does not meet in the road. They release the girls first, half an hour, so they can hide in the home and then they release the girls later on, so we never get to meet and have an exchange in anything. So imagine me leaving to the US. I know all these luck cultures, and I, and I know it's Aib, and I'm bringing a stranger to my village. So Sammy never knew that until we start talking. I did not tell my mom I'm bringing Sammy. <laughs> so, <laughs> Sammy is a surprise. Uh, he did not know, by the way, until he, like, recently he knew, like, every time he come, I don't tell my mom, Sam is coming. Because imagine I'm telling my mom, seven girls in the house, I'm bringing a, a man um, living in the U.S., uh, uh, I don't know, we used to call him, like, Jesus, right? This beautiful, long hair to hear. And I'm newly divorced with three children, and I'm walking in the street of Kufurai uh, with this young man, and the people are hesitated, who's that? And like, and I'm confident. Every morning we we'll wake up and we we'll walk in the whole Kufurai villages back and forth with Sammy. <laughs> Those days, anyhow. Uh, but he come home, and my mom will welcome him, and they loved him, and she made him all her favorite meals, and you know, al-fitir al-za'atar bit-tabun, and all the food. But why I took Sammy, we walked. We walked, we went to climb the olive trees, because I talk about the olive trees, how we always help my mom. So, back to the story, 1967, I was one year old. My mom came back from Jordan, but my father lived all his life in Abu Dhabi and he will come in the summer. So my mother has to take care of the land and the house and the children. 
one after the other. So we were picking up the olives with her and, and farm and taking care of the house and cooking and cleaning. The worst thing is I have laundry. Imagine washing for 13 children. So she was very strict that nobody in the village will say she's a woman. She raised the girls by themselves and then her girls did anything bad. Okay, so if I ever dare to go to anybody and see a man's shoes outside, I cannot enter. She was always feared that if I dated or I talked to a man, people is not going to blame my dad. My dad live in the Gulf. He come only in the summer for a vacation, two, three weeks and done. They're going to say, her mom, ma'arifat it rabbiha. Yes. But, and then people in the village, if I send my father, Ahmed Yusuf Sawalha, who's that? My father, since young age, from Nazareth to Kufurai, to the Gulf, nobody know him. They know her. So, Bint Maida, Bint M. Yusuf. If I said, Ana Abu, Abu Yusuf, or Ahmed Yusuf, nobody knows you. You are known by your mom. So, their, our reputation in the school is very important. So, she will stand in the rooftop. We were in the second floor in a hill, and she will watch us going to school, the three girls. I swear to you, if we move in the road to this side, lay, min can be sharia. There is a boy was in the street. You move from this side of the road, to, it's one road. If a car coming this way, the other car to stop to the side for the other car. She was so strict that we will never get to talk to any boys or any family members. So my uncle Najib, who is one year younger than her, his kids is our age. If we go to my grandfather's house and we see the shoes outside, no way we'll dare to walk in. So we will never get to talk to his boys, which is our age. So that's one of the story, because I have to do the laundry, Al-Ghassil bin Tishir, laundry in the rooftop of the house. Our rooftop, every few years she add a few feet of concrete, la sur, la fence, until it was higher than me, because the neighbor kids, who's two years younger than me, start growing up, and, and she doesn't want me to see me when I'm putting the laundry in the roof. That's how strict my mom. So when I said in the book, The Black Sheep, um, I studied, I finished high school, and then I moved and I studied in Jordan, and from Jordan I moved to the U.S. And during that time in the 80s, it was not the hijab strict and the cover, but later on all my sister is covered and she's covered, and I'm the only one insist not to cover, so it's very difficult for her um, to accept me. I'm not covered and I have more freedom than everybody else. So um, the idea from Sammy to see is, my, is what I'm telling him, is it true? Like he's listening to the same story from my mom and then my sister and then my brother. And then to eat with us, to see the rest of the family. And like he said, to walk the small road and streets so he saw where I was, where I'm growing up, what I'm describing. Because he is writing something, he did not live through it. So his visit for me was very important um, to come with me and meet everybody. Um, and then in, in, in that visit, he got the sense of the small village, the small family, Sawalha, the, I don't want to say the controlling mother, but, <laughs> but ehna, uh, all mother, we feel like they're overprotective than the father. Um, Growing up, even later on, I, when even I get married, I think I was a very great relationship with my dad, and until now I feel I, I'm closer to my dad than my mom because how much he was overprotective over us. Um, so um, it was very important for me uh, to, to take that bath with him. Um, yeah, it, it, uh, it was really... Uh, interesting that when I would go there, her mom was very, uh, you know, welcoming and open, and so she shielded me from all the fights that she was having with uh, her mom. And I was like, I'll stay somewhere else, but no, 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 you can stay with us. My mom's okay with it, and I didn't know that she wasn't necessarily okay, but she would, you know. 
She's okay, if you put her, like I will meet him at al Jisr in the checkpoint, and uh, he, he will go through the American side, I have Hawaii, so I go from the other side, and then we'll meet, and we take a taxi to Kufurai. My mom, she doesn't so show it in front of people, like, but you know, as soon as I come back from walking in the street with him, do you know how many times the phone rang? All the older women. Mini li ma ibn binti kan bishare. But then people don't call me by my name. El Amerikiy rahat. El Amerikiy ijad. Ulad el Amerikiy rah. People don't remember my kid's name. They just call me by el Amerikiy. For that one, she used to tell me when I'm small, "Is a dhika to ban nabha el haqha wala thabha." Did you guys understand it? <laughs> She used to say, yeah, so if you laugh and your teeth showing, so it means she's soft guys, you could flutter with her and follow her. So she has all these like says um, to protect us. So she's very, very funny. But in the end, um, it's not easy to raise girls um, without the father present and stuff like that. So that's, I understand now as a mother. Palestinian <laughs> Yeah, the, that uh, phrase is in the book, actually. The, the, the um, yeah, I don't remember which. Uh, uh, okay, so uh, the next, uh, last uh, scene that I'll, uh, I'll read is a scene where um, Serene is, as she said, she was in Amman studying and she was coming back to Kufarai before leaving to the U.S. Um, it's uh, 1990 and uh, she's uh, coming back home to say goodbye to her family before she leaves to the U.S. So this is one of the, those nights. Page page? Yes, the page is uh, page 90. Page 90 at the bottom of page 90. Yeah, there are some seats in the front if you want to sit. Um, Okay. Iyad came home on the second day of Sirin's visit. They met with warm smiles, a comfortable affection in the crinkling of their eyes. They hugged tightly and Iyad kissed her forehead. Um Yusuf had made Sirin's favorite dish for lunch, ma'lube, and they spent the rest of the afternoon catching up. Later that night, everyone went to sleep except for Sirin and Iyad. The house was quiet as they sat under a dim, flickering kerosene light in the glass-enclosed balcony enjoying a June breeze through two of its open windows. Iyad was wearing a gray tracksuit and bent over to fix his crew socks. He then turned to his sister and asked, can you make me dinner? In Sirin's voice. Really? I exclaimed. No way, it's too dark. Yalla, you barely ever see me. Iyad was persistent. Please don't make me get up. I miss your food. He gave me a smile and was uh, being annoying. No, you don't, I said. Khalas, I'm tired. Yalla, please, for me, he continued to nag. In the end, I caved and said fine. But I told him it wouldn't be anything fancy, just fried eggs, labne, and a plate of zeit zatar. Then, suddenly, we heard dogs bark in the distance. Sirin startled, and the barking grew much louder. Iyad looked into his sister's eyes. She could see the worry in the lowering of his eyebrows and the biting of his lip. But his steady shoulders showed the confidence of a man who had been in this situation many times before. The barking was followed by the sound of engines revving as, uh, revving as vehicles gained speed. Iyad and Sirin looked out and saw lights flare from two military vehicles rumbling up the road. Iyad slipped on his shoes, double knotted the laces, and clicked the back door open. Sirin's voice. I had just enough time to dip two pieces of bread and za'atar mixed with oil. I slipped them into my brother's hand. He grabbed a banana, his favorite fruit, and set off. In my voice. From the back exit, he passed them Farid's house and the houses of two other neighbors. Then, it was just him, a long winding path, and the dark hills ahead, with no homes and not a soul in sight. Soldiers knocked on the front gate, disturbing the jasmine tree. Sirin took her time to open it. When she did, they questioned her briefly. But when a neighbor's dog barked behind the house and further up the road, they knew Iyad had snuck out. They hurried back to their vehicle in chase. Iyad sprinted up the main path, then slipped out of sight using shrubs to hide his path. He melted into the rugged landscape, gliding in the darkness through rocky paths he had used many times before. 
In a few short minutes, he had scrambled down the hill on which his home was perched and made it halfway up another hill. Military vehicles hunted him down the dirt path, moving slowly. The soldiers scanned the area, but their view was limited as they were unwilling to trek into the valley. Iyad came to a cave within one of the surrounding hills. He entered and covered the opening with rocks and branches. There he waited, passing the time trying to pick Zatar out of his teeth and hoping snakes in the wild would let him be. By the time the military had finished scanning the area from afar, he had dozed off. The next morning, he walked into the family house covered in white dust, and Sirin could breathe again. So, like I said, 1990, uh, moving to New York, and it's December, and I'm gonna go back to Kufurai to say goodbye to all my family, and I made sure to get a camera and take pictures of all of them over and over and over. Actually, some of th one of the pictures in the book is uh, me took it to Iyad. I think Iyad never saw this picture. This is it. It was developed in the United States. So Iyad, uh, my neighbor, made him this wall, uh, the Palestinian flag T-shirt, a sweater, sorry, it's winter, with um, kofiya in his neck. Oh, uh, he was so excited. I think when I developed the film in New York, uh, I have two-thirds of it Iyad picture. Like in literally, there is one in the bedroom, living room, dining room, in the backyard, the front yard. He was so excited that his sister is moving to the U.S. And um, so he wanted to take a lot of picture. That day, um, as all Palestinians know, every Friday is a Maklubi day. Yes, Maklubi day. When I go now and visit with my kids, my kids had it. Like when we go back to New York, my kids ask me, don't cook Maklubi at all. Every Friday, all my sisters and my brother who's married live there, they come to the, my mom's house and we make maklubi. So we had maklubi and he had uh, once for dinner, Lebani, Jibni. It's like a light dinner in Palestine. I, I know that when they, the dog bark in the middle of the night and become so quiet, I knew means the Israeli just entered. But living in Jordan for four years kind of slipped my mind. So suddenly the village is so quiet and everybody starts running to different direction. Until now, when the dog bark in Kufurai, the Israeli just entered. Like literally last summer, we were visiting my cousin. Within a second, the dog start barking, the wild dogs in there. So he had a new jump. So the house is big, it, it's like two floors. Um, a, a door for the visitors with a big gate, with a jasmine tree in the gate, and there's the visitor to the living room and the family room. But there is a gate just for the family, us. He just, my Aunt Aida used to call him Tarazan. Fast, disappear in nowhere. And that door from one land to another, um, I think I visit the, the cave, the first time I visit that cave is 2018, and I was wondering how Iyad used to sleep there. Uh, we always terrified of snakes, um, because the plum season, we have a lot of plum trees, is in the summer, and the snakes are more in the summer, and we'll be climbing a plum tree to pick up with my mom, helping her early in the morning, and the snake is there. So I used to have really fear of snakes. So I always wonder how he ran in the dark, how he found his way to the cave, and he just dozed and slept and came yesterday, the next day dirty, a messy, he did not care. He's used to that. We call it mutarad, wanted. One time uh, they came in, he was wanted for a while. He ran so much before he was arrested, by the way. Uh, one time uh, they came in, uh, he did not have time to open the door and run. When they smack the door open, it's a metal door, it made a corner. He was behind the corner. And they search every room, closet, kitchen, bathroom, and he's holding his breath behind the metal door in that corner. Another time, they came in, he did not have time to run. 
My sister Suzanne came from Dubai with her younger children. My sister Maysoon from Saudi Arabia with her younger children. And you know, we're a big family, 13 children with the grandchildren. My mom has not enough beds. So we sleep uh, mattresses in the floor. Literally, he slept under the kids' feet. They laid down, he's in the middle. So the Israeli uncover the faces, uh, the blanket, they saw children faces. They uncover from the bottom children feet, he had in the middle. And they did not get him. Another time, because those mattresses and blanket, you put them in Palestine, we call it Nasbit Lifrash, I don't know. It's a closet for mattresses. Um, they came so fast, he hide, and my mom laid the mattress and the blanket in the top of him. And they took the first five, six blanket and mattresses, and then they did not get to the end because they gave up, no way, he's in the bottom. And he was in the bottom. Every time he was wanted, he found a way to run and escape from them. And for me, living in Jordan for a few years, like it's totally like um, try to... Uh, forget how stressful to be in Kufurah. And I was only for five days. Uh, I did not stay long. So um, the next day, I, when I arrived, by the way, I have this gorgeous leather jacket. First time I own a leather jacket. My sister was in her honeymoon. She got married that year and got me a beautiful leather jacket. So I walked in and he had... Um, 17 years old, trying it, and it fit perfect in him. And I'm saying, come on, don't be silly. This is a girl's jacket. It's so beautiful. Come on, it's a girl's jacket. So the next morning, uh, the juicer or the border taxi came to pick me up uh, 4.30 in the morning. So I wake up to say goodbye to all my brother and sister. We always cry because you'll never know when you're going to see them. And I really, uh, I will go while they're sleeping, uncover each one blanket, and I'm kissing them. I went to his mattress, and Iyad is not there. Guess what? Iyad stole the jacket, the leather jacket, ran away out of the house before I wake up and I see the leather jacket. So I never get to say goodbye to him that year. And the next time I saw him, that first scene when I visit in prison. So that's how, like, things get, me and him. And by the way, that jacket stayed with him all the years in prison, like for, for, for many years. So this is the daily life of just uh, living under the occupation. It was very stressful for him running around, trying to escape to be arrested, because he knew after the arrest what could happen to him. Yeah, and there's a photo of him with that jacket in, uh, in prison in the book. So. <laughs> Uh, so uh, we can, uh, you know, that, that's uh, our, our part of, uh, we can open it up for a question uh, Q&A and uh, I don't know. No, maybe you can. Dr. Sami, there is a writer and there is a ghost writer. You're both in this book. Um, I hate to say I enjoyed the book because it's so painful, but uh, it is very well written. Um, as your mother, the, the minute she walked back while everybody was fleeing, I could see the rest of her life and the way she brought you up and everything. But what I couldn't understand is how did she let you leave to Jordan, you and your sisters, to go study in Jordan on your own? So, um, first of all, about the walk back. Or our life, she is so proud of that story. Of course. Across the Jordan River, Suzanne dropped one of her pair of shoes and she cried. She shut her mouth so the Israeli doesn't return us. Suzanne, until now, when she grave a snack, she got the pita bread with uh, bandora, tomato sauce, picked a wood, smoked with olive oil and salt. So all she ate, a jar of tomato sauce with the pita bread. She never regret that trip. 
in our lives so she always kept repeating انا عملت عشانكم انا وانا وانا so my mom was always proud of what she did but when we finish high school it was the first intifada so you have two choice in najah university and bir zeit university for her no man in the house for me to be in bir zeit with the first intifada with how active i was She feared for that. So she agreed to send Suzanne, Maysoon, and Syrian to study in Jordan. And then when she noticed, like, we never came back. We got a job. I moved to the U.S. One moved to Dubai, one to Saudi Arabia. Arseline, Suhan, Sausan, the next three girls, the boys went uh, to Russia and to the U.S. too. Uh, Yusuf and Ihab. But when it came to the three girls after the three boys, she refused. No more and Najah or Bir Zaid, all my whoever after Iyad went there because of the fear. She's losing us one after the other. Yeah. One more question. Go ahead. Is, uh, is the book going to be translated into Arabic? To Arabic, of course. That's why we are in Kuwait today. Oh, okay. Great. Great. Thank you. Yes. Do we have any more questions? I have a question. Um, I was wondering about the decisions you have to make as co-authors to some degree of what to include and disinclude. And I know you mentioned in the beginning that most of the time it's a technical issue of how a story flows, but maybe there are more emotional components to the necessity of including them in the story and do those come into play? Do you agree and disagree? Is it a rock, paper, scissors moment? Like how do you both kind of reach a conclusion of what to include? Yeah, um, I think th uh, that's a great, great question. Um, th there was a moment, uh, so we would uh, de debate these. I would write a, a version of, uh, a, you know, a, a chapter or a few chapters or whatnot, uh, send it to Serene and, uh, you know, she would uh, give it a look and, and she might say, she might say, you know, you're missing these things or, Uh, I'd like this this in, and then after that whole process, there was the publisher, right, the editor who who came in. Um, so there's there's two things I'd say. First, there was a moment where I realized I'm not here to expose the family, I'm here to tell their story, and there's a very fine line because when you're telling the story, there's you know you're inevitably talking about their some private things. Uh, there's uh, th there is a the notion of exposing. Um, but there were moments when I realized I'm not here to expose because there was a, Serene told me a lot of things um, and there would be two or three more books here that we could, we could write but there was things that does this really matter to you as the reader to know these things would it really ad, you know, advance your knowledge about uh, the story or about Palestine or about right, th these kind of things where I, fe I felt that it wasn't needed and then when the publisher came in Um, there was this added thing where we were so close to it. She wants to tell the story of all her brothers and sisters, right? And uh, all their little details. And I've been listening to them for so long. I want to tell all these stories too. But the, pu the publisher is like, no, people aren't going to care as much as the two of you care about these things, you know? Um, I mean, I, I say it's, it's, it's a very crude way of saying people are not going to... But, you know, you as the reader want some kind of flow, you want to be captured by the story. And so there are these kind of decisions that one has to make that I, in the beginning when I was first writing, I was also very committed to wanting to tell it the way she was, you know, you see how she's really animated and how do I capture that in the book? And I you know, also realized that I'm not an oral storyteller, I'm a writer. And, and so there's, you know, I have to give up on trying to do a perfect match. Um, so yeah, I, I think, uh, Yeah. So I wanted to tell it all. And I'm different than my mom. Aib, and I'm not going to be able to tell it all. And I'm not going to be able to I wanted to tell it all because in every one of us, we went different path and each one has a story. Like, it's not just Iyad who went to prison. Baha went to prison. Oh, my sister Arsirin went to prison too. Like, I have different stories, different experience in life. So, it's like he said, 13 children. Um, it's very difficult. 
It's very difficult. Yes, I concentrate in Iyad because Iyad used to say to m every time we complain, Iyad, stop your activism and stuff like that. He says to Immi, Wallah, Nick Bakhili, Haram is a Dahiti Bwalad, Lahalwatan. Yani, we're 13, sacrificed one for Palestine. That was his, always his answer. So for me, Yes, we, we say my brother, I talked about Iyad, but in the same time, each one has a role. And I remember the last couple of months before publishing Ihab's story, when he went to Qaryat Fahmi. And Sami says, why would you need to merge it? It's important for me, I want Ihab. That story is very important in Ihab life, who live in Moscow, I wanna keep it. But then it came to Yusuf, who live in the US, I think a month before the book is printed, I have to move a whole section about Yusuf. Politically, is not right. I'm fearing for him. So yes, there is things I want to tell, but in the same time, I don't want to harm my family who's go back and forth to Kafarai, and they have Hawaii, and they have Palestinian passport. Yes, they have an American citizen, but still, it could impact their life. We ended up remove it. So it's not was an easy decision. And, and Sammy, like he said, there is things I insist to stay, and he was like, no, we should not keep it. But I could say, but it will make a great story in the end from my side. But politically, what's correct is not was an easy decision when we added it. Yeah. Thank you. Yeah, that makes a lot of sense. Where's Iyad? Uh, you, you need to read the book, or do we do? I don't want to spoil it. Yeah. Yeah. Um, hello, and though I didn't get the chance to read the book, but I'd like to thank you from the bottom of my heart to raise, uh, to get us today to talk about this book, um, which I don't know how much I was attached to hear about your mother, the great mother, the mother that represents all Palestinian women. She's not, a, uh, you, you described her as a conservative woman. She's not a, a controlling woman. She's not a controlling woman. She's a caring mother, really. She's, um, I hope that when I read the book, I will get more, uh, young, uh, what I want to say, really. She's the, she represents the great woman that raised great ladies like you and your brother who is suffering in the prisons, uh, in the prison in Israel. To me, as a mother, it's easier for me to have a ma uh, my son uh, to consider him as a martyr than he's there suffering the life. Um, I like the part when you were talking about the book, when you talked about the plum trees. I felt the pathway. Uh, when you talked about uh, the night when the dogs bark, imagine how this affects the, the lives of the uh, people who are living there, your village, every part. Thank you, Sami, for, uh, for uh, working together with Serene, because here where you, I'm sure that the story is uh, reflecting a real part of life which will um, affect us more when we read it than having a, an imaginative story. Thank you so much, and thank you for your mother who made it, uh, who um, made it. Thank you, Velma, my dear, uh, because you, you facilitate the things for us to come here and to have this evening. Thank you so much. It was really good. Thank you so much. Yeah, when you get to read the book, you will love Im Yusuf. She run us like a factory. One dishes, one wash the floor, one dust, one cook, one clean. No, you're right. You know, she is the land. When I said my brother, my land, my mom is the land. My mom is like the land. She was giving, she was caring, and she preserved the land uh, for my father and for us and for generation. Because the Palestinian, when they immigrated in 1948, they carried the key for their homes. My mom hated that. 
She wanted to go back to that home. And when you read the book, you're going to find that the home starts with two bedrooms and a kitchen and a bathroom. My father will send her money from Abu Dhabi instead of buying a piece of gold or a new clothes for her. She add a room and add a floor and add a bathroom. This is how it was. This is how our home was. So she was really everything for us, you know. And it's not difficult for one woman, and my father is the only child, like, to raise 13 children by herself. And 13 graduated university. She was really, uh, yes, education was number one for her. Yes, you work in the land, you pick the plums and the olives, but you come home, and I finished high school in the gas lab. Like, literally, this is how she is. And I think I changed career, and I went uh, to my master's degree while I'm in my 40s with three children after I got divorced because of hair bushing. Uh, so, yeah, she really worked hard, and you get to love her. <laughs> Thank you. Um, you know, I, I want to say something about this. Um, I think um, when you hear how, you know, children might talk about their parents uh, in private. Um, and especially, you know, there was hard moments. So um, I, I, I do hope, um, I think there, you know, one could, if I, this is one of those things where you can air out a lot of dirty laundry, but then uh, the, that, that image wouldn't even be, wouldn't be accurate because there is a way that, you know, children might talk about their parents. Um, I, and I, I did want to write a story that really uh, sort of told itself. Uh, I wasn't so much, and you know, a lot of our, our problem in the Arab world is that we're stuck within uh, sort of a lot of Western narratives. So, for example, the the way that uh, you know women are represented in the Arab world, right? And so you have to speak out against that, or the other big thing that comes up in this book is resistance, right? The way that resistance is spoken about in the Arab world and what is, what is resistance. And so I wanted to be able to try to tell a story where I wasn't, where the woman will speak for herself, this is her life, right? It's, uh, it's not because, uh, you know, she's a strong woman or a weak woman, she's a woman. She's a Palestinian woman and there are Palestinian women of all, you know, rainbows, right? Um, and I wanted to tell a story of resistance, and that resistance comes in all shapes, and there's resistance, um, you know, there's armed resistance, and we shouldn't apologize for armed res resistance, and we shouldn't be afraid to, uh, to talk about it uh, in whatever, however you want to talk about it, um, and not, you know, uh, to really, to subscribe to uh, this idea that what a, you know, that Palestinian resistance is terrorism, right? Um, I don't care how you, who you target, where you target, it's resistance. Whether you, you agree with it or not is another story. Uh, whether you think it's a good idea or not is another story, but it's, it's resistance, right? Um, and so I, I wanted to be able to tell that story in a way that was not apologetic. And I don't think you have that in the English language, which is also, uh, you know, you're writing against that, uh, you know, writing against that. And I, you know, I have to thank Stanford for actually accepting to publish this. Yeah. <laughs> we have time for one more question, if anyone is interested. First of all, I'm sure we're all so happy to be here and honored to be here tonight, uh, listening to both of you, Sami and Serene. And while I was listening to you, Serene, um, you said, I love storytelling. And it hit me because I'm reading right now, Gaza writes back to Rafat al arair And he opens with the first line in his introduction, we tell stories because we love our land. And he said another thing, in a comment on what Sami just said. He said, I want my students to write their own Palestinian stories in English so there would be no authority for translation. So exactly what they feel, what they live, is gonna be read 
by the others or you know the western narrative would not have any authority on palestinian uh, narrative um, so i'm really thankful for your book and i'm sure that everyone is and i think it's now the time for palestinian narrative to be said in english so it would be for the entire world and maybe that was the main reason like you said why you chose to tell your story in english um, as a first language and uh, yeah that was my comment so thank you thank you very much uh, just uh, uh, Iman will, will likely be the translator uh, of, the, of the book to Arabic. So uh, the, the, uh, I think uh, w just one thing, I, 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 the question of translation is an important one because one, when I was writing, I was telling people the other day, uh, early drafts of this book, um, even when I sent it to Stanford, had so much Arabic in it uh, that Stanford was like, you know, what are you doing with, right? there was a lot of, um, I, I was trying to tell the story in English with an Arab audience in mind. And then I realized I'm writing the story in, Ara in English with a US press. I need to have uh, an, an American audience in mind. Um, and so there are parts, for example, where I have to do a little bit of explaining. So for example, I would initially would have said Abu Kant Aban and move on and let you know, to hell with that, uh, you know, American audience who doesn't understand Arabic because I was in a way trying to talk to the, maybe the Arab American. And then, you know, with rounds of edits, it was, okay, I need to, uh, they're going to be totally lost. I, there, were, there was a chapter where I started no date and I had um, when Ghassan Kanafani was assassinated. And, you know, the reader is expected to know that that's now we're in 1972. Um, and, I, you know, were, the press was like, you need dates. And I was like, they can look it up. You can Google when Ghassan can have any. <laughs> so, uh, but then, you know, in, a, in the Arabic, uh, for the Arabic reader, now it becomes a different. So, uh, you know, God help you. You know, I think, and so, when I moved to the UN, will ask me, where are you from? Palestine. Pakistan? No, Palestine. Oh, you mean Israel? That used to bother me. We did not have phones to pull the phone and say, this is the map, I'm a Palestinian. So, al kufiya became my, uh, my symbol, my identity, I'm Palestinian. So, everywhere I sit, I want to tell the Palestinian story. And that's why I, I want it in English for the American readers first. Letting know Arabic readers, we read so many stories, we watch so many news, we know a lot of Palestinian, and everyone has a family, friends who are Palestinian tell you a story. But the American don't have. And then when we just, um, oh, uh, Santa Barbara University, the student just read it, and they interviewed us last week after they read it. The question is great. The kids are listening to story they never know about. So it's very important, uh, like she said, the, the American, the English reader is very important for the Palestinian cause and question. And I always say, if any change is going to happen, it's from the United States. And you could see the protests now in Princeton University, in Columbia, in NYU. And w I, I live in Princeton, and now I'm getting hundreds of messages. You're missing. This is what you want. Like, this is I always wanted. So it's very important to educate those generation about what's going on in Palestine. And now the, the problem in Palestine, is not October 7 only, 1948, 1967, it's been happening, but the Americans start hearing about us just recently. Just recently, so it's very important for the English reader. Right, yeah, so. We can do one last question here. Really be just for Arabic. Uh, 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 higher priorities for the other languages. 
Yeah, um, so there is, I think, a Turkish uh, translation, for example. So th they're going to, th hopefully it will get uh, picked up. But I do want to say um, it's not about um, addressing, you know, because it's, you know, America and uh, the power and so on. But uh, actually, it's not an Israeli genocide. It's an American genocide, right? It's an American genocide with Israeli soldiers. And so, and so in that sense, Americans need to understand what what they're actually doing right and <laughs> I said this on Al Jazeera so it's okay <laughs> but you know it, uh, so I think the just the, I, I wanted to stress that point um, that the and of course you know I write in English ultimately so it's not it's not by choice it's by uh, you know it's by force yeah Yeah, it is. Yeah. So I, I would love it to be translated to every language in the world. I like this is my dream. And uh, somebody in Stanford University, she stood up and said, when is going to be a movie? I was like, yeah, yeah, great. Sammy said, reserve the dress you're wearing in the cover because we're going to have a movie. And I was like, yeah, why not? Like, literally, we took care of every detail, even the cover. This is, was not easy. Like, they had a donkey with a man in the cover, and I insist, no, I want al awda hamdala. Always we go back. al awda is part of our home and our uh, life. So there is a lot of things. Um, like he said, we are open to a movie, to a Syrian uh, theory episode for Ramadan, inshallah. <laughs> it will be nice. But... Uh, every Palestinian has a story. And some people, they tell it to their children and forget about it, but it's most important to keep telling it. Like my aunt Aida did not have children. All my life when we were young, Habibti Mishtinsi, if Palestine became free, Ta'ali ala kabri wa ulili, come to my grave and tell me. All her life before she died. So Anna, I'm telling my kids now, no, I want it to be free in my generation. In my generation, inshallah, taban, inshallah. <laughs> so we pass messages to children, to our grandchildren, and we pass the key for the house in Akka and Haifa and Nazareth. And I have two uncles. My grandfather was married twice. His first wife from Nazareth. I have two uncles in Nazareth. I never seen. I know with their name from my dad who lived with his mom as a young kid in 1940, but I never seen. So I wanted my kids one day to go to Nazareth and meet my cousins and their children. So we need to keep telling. And the more telling, the more we educating people to the Palestinian. We are here. We are everywhere and we're here and we're present and everyone could tell their story. And this is the Sawalha story. And inshallah, you will like it, guys. Thank you very much. Can I just uh, just say one one word? Faiz um, Sayyid, in uh, I think it's 1962, uh, said that um, rights undefended are rights surrendered. So uh, as long as we're we're fighting, we're talking, uh, those rights are uh, continue to be rights that are defended and not surrendered.